There's an occult history in sport, the history of sporting failures and big sporting flops. As we approach the World Test Championship in a couple of days' time, we delve into the dark and often extremely funny history of big sports flops. Welcome to The Luke Alfred Show. I have 30 years of experience on the front lines of sports journalism, covering some of the biggest games in cricket, rugby, the FIFA World Cup, and even the Olympic Games. Come and join me as we learn about the greatest sports stories you've never heard. I'm Luke Alfred, and welcome to the show. The subject of this week's podcast is big sporting flops. We're going to have fun with flops. The sport which involves having fun with flops is called flopping, incidentally. But there's also going to be a serious, intellectually responsible, and wherever possible, historically accurate undertow to our discussion. In the serious part of the discussion, I promise to steer well clear of astonishingly lame jokes which lower the tone and take us back to where we started. Flip-flopping, in other words. Without perhaps thinking about it too deeply, we have all lived through or witnessed some major sporting flops. Think of Fernando Torres's move from Liverpool to Chelsea or Paul Pogba's less-than-stellar stay at Manchester United. There were sporting events too. Think about COVID-19 and how the pandemic tended to signal the death knell for matches, tournaments and tours. How about the British and Irish Lions Tour of South Africa in 2019 as one of the top flops of our sporting era? All those empty stadiums, all that canned noise, all that mileage for sponsors in which they weren't really getting any mileage at all, all those funny computer-generated dudes looking vaguely lifelike but also grimly dead in the stands. A hollowed-out watermelon hat is a hollowed-out watermelon hat. There's no replacing it. As there's no replacing the felt hat, or what always looks to me like a Viking hat with humongous bull's horns on it, that's live sport for you, and that's what makes it what it is. And what of all that desperate self-aggrandizing talk from television executives that the show must go on? If we wanted to watch sport on the moon, we would have already built a stadium in the Sea of Tranquility. It would be called the Deutsche Bank Tranquility Stadium, and you know what? It would be a place where sport went to die. Talking of places where sport went to die, one of the greatest sporting flops of our time happened at the Moscow Olympics in 1980. It all began in December of the previous year with the USSR's invasion of Afghanistan, an act of aggression to which many, but particularly the U.S., took exception. The first public intellectual to moot a boycott after the invasion was, ironically, a Russian, dissident nuclear scientist Andrei Sakharov, but the wheel of the boycott bus was soon grabbed by U.S. President Jimmy Carter, with Canadian Prime Minister Joe Clark riding shotgun. To think that Carter had once flirted with the idea of grain sanctions against the USSR, a strategy hardly likely to merit a second on page three of the New York Times. Now this, the B-word. B-words, as we all know, make for banner headlines. How Jimmy must have rubbed his hands in absolute glee. Through the early months of 1980, the boycott bus gathered speed. It wasn't travelling so fast, however, that it couldn't make the occasional stop. Many passengers and possible passengers, some still deciding, approved of the route the boycott bus was taking. Amongst the more high-profile passengers was West German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. At one point, Carter suggested the Games be permanently moved to Greece. This would honour the Games' historical foundations and founding precepts and or so Carter argued in a moment of truly mind-numbing naivety, remove the games from politics. In a gesture which was clearly political, the International Olympic Committee, the IOC for short, rejected Carter's proposal. Lord Killannon, the IOC's president, said as the games grew nearer that Carter's boycott call was, quote, an inappropriate means to achieve a political end and the ultimate victims of the boycott would be the athletes. The impasse continued. 
Moscow was scheduled to host the Olympics in late July 1980, and whether the USSR had invaded Afghanistan or not, the Olympic flames, said Kilanen, must not be extinguished. The game, sorry, the games must go on. Lord Kilanen's chest thumping notwithstanding, the US, the Canadians, the West Germans and the Chinese duly boycotted Moscow. So too did South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Pakistan, Norway, Israel, Ghana, Kenya, Egypt, Turkey, Argentina and Uruguay, to name but a few. In all, 66 nations decided that Moscow was not for them. It was the largest boycott in the history of the Olympics and very probably the largest boycott action, although how do you measure these things, in the history of sport. Some governments kicked the can down the road, supporting the boycott but passing the final decision about participation to their national federations. This was the case with Australia, the United Kingdom, Sweden and France. The Australian Olympic Federation, for example, sent a team, but they didn't participate under either the national flag of Australia or the flag of the Australian National Olympic Federation. In a moral contortion, which might have impressed them but fooled few others, the Aussies competed under the Olympic flag, as did Andorra, one of those inspired useless facts which, I'm sure, will have added much-needed cheer to your otherwise dull and duty-ridden day as you grapple with load-shedding and you wonder what you're going to cook for dinner. In certain cases, the decision about whether to participate or not devolved to individual sports within their national federations. So, for instance, the United Kingdom did not send a men or women's hockey team, a shooting team, or an equestrian team. British yachting sailed right past Moscow too. The British Federation also sent a substantially reduced athletics team, although both of their gun middle distance athletes of the day, Seb Coe and Steve Ovette, participated in their requisite events. Athletics purists and aficionados generally scoffed at times across the athletic disciplines, however, arguing that they were slow and crabby. There were also widespread allegations of cheating from Soviet officialdom, to which the IOC officials generally turned a blind eye. The Aussies weren't the only nation who wanted to have their Moscow cake and eat it. Athletes from Spain and Italy competed under a neutral flag, with the Olympic anthem being played rather than their national anthem in the event of medals being awarded. Italy did rather well in Moscow, finishing fifth on the medals table between Cuba and Hungary, with 15 medals overall, eight of them gold. Spain weren't as impressive. They finished 20th on the medals table, with six medals overall, one of which was gold. Other nations finessed their way through this moral political maze as best they saw fit. Some allowed individuals to compete if they were sanctioned by their national federation and the sporting code within that federation, although their government had formally decided to boycott the event. Some participated at Moscow but did not attend the traditional march past during the opening ceremony. A good way of looking at Moscow and what the Moscow Olympics lacked in terms of participation at the top of the medal table is to look at the medal table at the end of the Montreal Olympics in 1976. It doesn't make sense to look at the medals table at the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics because 14 Soviet-aligned nations, including East Germany, Cuba and Bulgaria, boycotted those in what was widely seen as a tit-for-tat gesture for the widespread boycott of Moscow. In a way, the most immediate normal Olympics, if normal is taken to mean fullest participation, was in Canada in 1976. At both Montreal and Moscow, the top two on the medals table were the Soviet Union and East Germany, in that order. After that, it changes. In Montreal, third on the medals table was the USA, followed by West Germany and Japan. Third, fourth and fifth on the medals table in Moscow were Bulgaria, Cuba and Italy, who placed seventh, eighth and fourteenth in Montreal. 
What really contributed to Moscow being a flop is caught in this little factoid. Three of the top five medal winners in Montreal, the USA, West Germany and Japan, were absent in Moscow, along with their athletes, like the peerless American hurdler, Ed Moses. Along with the absence of 63 other nations, excluding the mighty Andorra, of course, this as much as any other fact can tells us the story of the flopped Moscow Olympics. So too does heavy-handed security, in which winning athletes were sometimes prevented from completing victory laps, as does the fact that as a percentage of medals won, the USSR won the most number of medals since the USA at the 1904 St. Louis Olympics. The Moscow Olympics was undoubtedly a lopsided, inadequate and partial event, but is it fair and accurate to brand the 1980 Olympics as a complete and utter flop? It was a compromised event, yes, held hostage to the geopolitics and the Cold War shibboleths of the times, but it went on until the end. Medals were awarded, records broken, not that many as it so happened, anthems sung. Folk even fell in love with the cuddly official mascot, Misha the Bear. Within this greater context of the half-flop flop, there were some remarkable stories. Take that of the Zimbabwe women's hockey side, who decided to take part in the Olympics at short notice, while their men folk, who also received an invitation, did not, sniffing that because the top European men's teams were boycotting the event, participation in Moscow was beneath them. The women's team thought otherwise, and it's such a wonderful story that I'll be devoting a full podcast to it in due course. They first flew to Lusaka, in the back of a splattering Zimbabwe Air Force Dakota, where they were picked up by an Aeroflot jet and whisked away to Moscow. Once they landed, they were impressed with what they found, although the crack American journalist George Plimpton wrote in Harper's Magazine in 1980 that the streets of Moscow were removed of undesirables and that the shops were stocked with food ordinary Muscovites couldn't buy. The Zimbabwe woman arrived in Moscow two weeks before the start of the Games, and this decision turned out to be inspired. First, it allowed them to play several friendlies, one against India, which the Zimbabweans lost. Second, it allowed them to get the feel of AstroTurf, which they were unused to because they still played on grass. In the context of their unfolding adventure, these two things proved to be vital. The Zimbabweans were invited because many of the nations who had qualified for the event were boycotting it, and the field was small, with only five other competing teams, including the hosts. The Zimbabweans won their opening fixtures against Poland and the USSR, two draws against the fancied Indians, and Czechoslovakia followed. Going into their final match against Austria, and the Zimbabwean women were unbeaten. At this point, the permutations were weird. If they beat Austria, they would win the gold medal. If they drew with Austria, they would win bronze. And if they lost, they would get nothing. In the event, they won their final game against Austria 4-1 to take gold. Zimbabwe's only medal of the games. What had started out six months before, with Jimmy Carter considering grain sanctions against the USSR, found its own momentum and developed into a 66-nation strong boycott. The Moscow Olympics probably was a bit of a flop, but flops don't flop quite the same way for everyone, as the school teachers, hockey coaches and housewives of newly independent Zimbabwe found out to their credit. According to some of the women in Moscow, the Zimbabwe hockey men sulked for years. Every flop is unique in its own floppy way. Flops flopped in really interesting ways during COVID, partly, I think, because the pandemic demonstrated that normal had a very different meaning in different parts of the world. What looks like common sense to one person looks loopy and draconian to another. I'm thinking here of the New Zealanders. Remember the Proteas two-test tour of New Zealand in early 2022 at the height of the pandemic? The South Africans had to submit to Kiwi regulations in touring New Zealand, 
which went under the grimly Orwellian acronym of MIQ, which stands for Managed Isolation and Quarantine System. In short, the Managed Isolation and Quarantine System meant the Proteas were left to see how many push-ups they could do in their hotel rooms. When that became too repetitive, they chatted on Zoom and tried not to put too much weight on by keeping room service busy. After 10 days of this, with no warm-up match since they left South Africa, they went into the first test in Christchurch, more undercooked than a raw chicken breast, and were promptly bowled out for 95 and 111. The Kiwis posted 4-8-2, Henry Nichols scoring 105 and Tom Blundell scoring 96, as spectators watched in segregated pens, vaguely reminiscent of apartheid. The home side won by an innings and 276 runs. Not only was it a flop performance, South Africa's second worst ever loss, but it was a flop event, so flop squared, a floppity flop. This one being made slightly more palatable by the fact that the South Africans stormed back in the second test, again played in Christchurch, they won that one by 198 runs. The New Zealand cricket team seemed to have a way of gravitating towards flops, or perhaps flops simply have a way of finding them, I'm not entirely sure. A far better side than the one who beat South Africa by an innings and 276 runs in Christchurch in 2022, participated in the inaugural World Test Championship final in June 2021. They were only there, some have argued, because Australia postponed a test series against South Africa the Aussies might well have won. If this had been the case, they, and not the Kiwis, would have been in the inaugural World Test Championship final against India. As it was, New Zealand found themselves in the final as a result of winning three of their most recent five series, beating Pakistan, India and the West Indies at home, all three of them by impressive 2-0 margins. Their away form wasn't quite as definitive. They drew 1-1 with Sri Lanka away and lost 3-0 away to Australia. On the back of such results, and given Australia's decision not to tour South Africa because of COVID, the Kiwis found themselves in the final. Not only did they find themselves in the final, but they won the damn thing. Played at the Rose Bowl in Southampton rather than Lords, after it was decided that a hotel in the Rose Bowl precinct made it easier to secure a bubble environment, the game was a low-scoring, wet and rather bedraggled affair. Days one and four were entirely lost to rain. After New Zealand won the toss and opted to bowl, Ajinka Rahani top scored for India with his 117 ball 49 in a ball dominated Indian innings of 217, Kyle Jamison taking 5 for 31. In reply, New Zealand mustered 249, 32 more runs than the Indians. For them, Devon Conway scored a painstaking 50, and Mohammed Shami took 4 for 76. India could only manage 170 in their second dig, meaning New Zealand only needed 140 runs to win batting last, and this they only managed for the loss of two wickets down. As an invented tradition, it was a largely anticlimactic final, played away from the participating countries in a COVID bubble for the benefit of a lukewarm television audience, often in a drizzle. Kane Williamson, the Kiwi skipper, was clearly moved by the victory, given New Zealand's heartbreaking loss to England in the final of the 50-over World Cup in 2019. But still, there was a vague air of flop all about it. Perhaps there was just too much air in the flop. How could a team, for example, beaten 3-0 by Australia, lay claim to being one of the best two test teams in the world before actually claiming the title? No one bakes a cake quite as badly as the International Cricket Council or so it seems. Invented traditions are interesting things and invariably take place in an environment that is political without appearing to be so. The cult of British royal monarchy that cast its light across the globe today was, for example, a tradition invented in response to awkward questions being asked about the status of the monarchy by the newly enfranchised within the context of a growing and energetic democracy. 
Who knows, for example, that in her inauguration in 1838, Queen Victoria's ring didn't fit her finger. The seating plan was haywire, and the entire event turned out to be a damp squib maligned by commentators. The British monarchy of today, the much-loved sentimental heart at the core of the nation, was a dubious notion in the 1850s and 1860s. Working-class Britons of the time were not averse to the idea of a republic. They didn't approve of Queen Victoria's meddlesome hand in parliamentary politics and grinned when the monarchy tried to downplay their Germanic roots in the House of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. By the time of Victoria's slick and expertly stage-managed Golden Jubilee, nearly 50 years later, the monarchy had become a public relations machine, leading the historian Eric Hobsbawm to write, quote, that the revival of royal ritualism was seen as a necessary counterweight to the dangers of popular democracy. This detour down the winding lanes of history serves the purpose of demonstrating that we shouldn't be blind to what lurks behind the invention of the World Test Championship. What lurks behind the invented tradition is the ICC's almost complete failure to govern the game, to make non-partisan decisions for the good of the game, and to stand up to India. In the absence of governance, they have conjured up a competition. The World Test Championship has about it the gloss of prestige, but how prestigious can a competition be when all the participants in the championship don't play the same number of matches? In this regard, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh only played 12 tests in the most recent cycle, while the West Indies and New Zealand only played 13. You can't have a competition when the participants in the competition don't play the same number of matches. You're fooling yourself and you're fooling the public. The cake has been baked. It's in the oven but doesn't seem to be rising as it should. Not enough baking powder, not enough bicarbonate of soda. A flop seems to be on its way. The World Test Championship final being played at the Oval this coming week certainly makes more sense for Australia as they prepare for the Ashes. And the one-off test also makes sense for purists and tragics as they keep a beady eye on one of the big movers in the international game in the last year, in the Australian all-rounder Cameron Green. Green has just come off a stellar IPL for the Mumbai Indians, but South Africans will remember him for doing a creditable job of spoiling their Christmas. In taking 5 for 27 after early inroads from Mitchell Stark, Green saw to it that South Africa could only post 189 in their first innings of the MCG test on Boxing Day last year. In response, Australia monstered their way to 575 for 8 declared, thanks to a double century by David Warner, a century to Alex Carey, and a not-out 50 for Green. To the untrained eye, Green might look like a gangly kid who is playing beyond his station. In his case, first impressions are badly wrong. He's very good on the leg side and slightly unusually for a tall man, is very good on anything short, particularly against the spinners. He's already come through Australia's tour of India with his reputation enhanced, but his summer in England will either be the making or the breaking of him. In March, he scored his debut Test 100 against India in Ahmedabad, and talk in the world game is that we're witnessing the progress of something very special. England have stresses with their bowling unit, but if Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad are fit for the Ashes, you rather feel they might have something to say about that. Green's rise is all the more exciting because there's been a lack of quality all-rounders in the Aussie game for quite some time. Shane Watson was a gifted but frustrating player, and the War Brothers were no more than nuisance bowlers, capable of wrecking the odd partnership. Now we have the gangly Green. After a summer in England beginning with the World Test Championship final, we will have a far better idea of whether he is green any longer. If you enjoyed this episode of The Luke Alfred Show, please like, share, follow and subscribe. I write full scripts for the show in the form of long-form essays, and these are all available on my Substack. To get written episodes of The Luke Alfred Show a day early on Fridays, please check out The Luke Alfred Substack. 
You can hear The Luke Alfred Show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I release a new episode every Saturday at 10.30 a.m. South African Standard Time.